hello and welcome back to my channel in today's video we look at a very interesting but sensitive topic the history of african involvement in the slave trade but before we get started please subscribe like and don't forget to share your opinion on what you think about this video and this topic yes historical records show that some african societies were involved in the slave trade selling captives to european and arab traders however it's essential to recognize the complexity of the transatlantic slave trade which was driven and perpetuated primarily by european powers now the involvement of certain African groups does not justify or excuse the extensive and brutal exploitation carried out by European colonizers. The historical debate surrounding African involvement in the transatlantic slave trade is a complex and multifaceted discussion. On one hand, there is evidence of some African societies participating in the capture and sale of fellow Africans to European and Arab traders. On the other hand, postulating that these actions were universally representative of all Africans simplifies a complex history. Furthermore, discussions also arise about the involvement of freed individuals of African descent who in some cases became slaveholders. Now this debate requires a critical examination acknowledging the diversity of experiences and roles played by various groups within the historical context of slavery. So check out these videos. I will be right back and when I do we talk more about this topic. Can we talk about the argument about black people owning slaves too and why it's such an argument? Um, I'm gonna go ahead and just give you a little background of history. Um, in the south in the antebellum South, prior to the Civil War, around 8% of Black people were freed. Oftentimes, those freed people would buy slaves. The reason they were buying the slaves is because they were their family, their friends, their spouses. In most cases. Okay, and the reason they couldn't free a lot of them is because of taxation. They did not want to get taxed. You get taxed at a higher rate as a freedman than you did as a slave. Okay, so that means that they were keeping them as slaves, not because they were using them as actual slaves, but because taxes and they, the money, it was money. Now, let's talk about how many black people were actual slave owners, which was about 2% of the population of blacks in the south at the time and let's say some of those slave owners were run-of-the-mill like the slave owners we are familiar with aka owners um, in which they used other black people as free labor and treated them as livestock as black people say not all skin folk is kin folk does that still make slavery okay is that because i don't understand why it's a gotcha that black people owned slaves because it's still wrong it's still it's still slavery. And so let's talk about post-slavery. Those black slave owners, like all black people in the South, were subject to segregation. So that means that the legacy of slavery also led to the legacy of segregation, which lasted well into the 1960s. Um, just for frame of reference, both my parents remember segregation. And I was born 11 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1965. And I was born six miles from a sundown town that did not integrate well into the 1990s. So the legacy of slavery is vast and long. And it's not a gotcha to say, well, black people had slaves too. It doesn't make slavery better. And I don't know why we do that. That's not a very good argument. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we usually just talk about how the Europeans black like Africans from their homes and force them into labor. But we rarely ever talk about the part that black Africans themselves had to play within this notorious historical event. Slavery was an ancient practice within Africa, but on an extremely small scale. People who purchased slaves did so in a means of providing these outcasts of a said society with a social framework. The organization of African society does not allow isolation or individualism. With the coming of Europeans, the volume of trading human beings swelled to huge proportions. Their establishment of sugar, cotton and tobacco plantations gave rise to a demand for an abundant yet cheap labour force. The true beginnings of the slave trade coincided with the fall of the greatest African empire, Songhai. The breaking up of the land into a number of small kingdoms and political divisions at tribal level, many of which were hostile to each other, favoured the expansion of the slave trade. 
During the night, a village would be encircled by chief warriors and at dawn, an attack would take place. They would set fire to huts and any person caught trying to escape would be put to death. Africans could be enslaved by being captured during battles or even as a form of punishment. But war and slavery were the main source Captives were shipped and endured long journeys in order to get to the coast. African merchants made the captives carry a stone or heavy sandbags throughout the whole journey so that they'll be too exhausted to escape. Once reaching the trading post, the Europeans would offer their prices for the slaves. If it was too low, the African merchants would refuse to sell, but whilst they were waiting for the highest bid, slaves were placed in these large stone forts that the Europeans built. From there, they would be dispatched to take to America. In exchange, the Africans would receive goods such as textiles, arms and alcohol. You really sold a human being for alcohol and... Once the Dahomey and Ashanti began trading with the Europeans directly on a much larger scale, it became a state monopoly and was no longer done by private African merchants. The Dahomey were one of the most important slave exporting regions in Africa during the- The number of, of people who were enslaved in uh, North Africa by the Barbary pirates exceeded the number of Africans enslaved in the United States and in the American colonies before that put together. I know, but nobody is going to North Africa to ask for reparations because nobody is going to be fool enough to give it to them. Slavery has been a universal institution for thousands of years, as far back as you can trace human history. And what we're looking at is if slavery is something that happened to one race of people in one country, when in fact the, 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 the spread of it was around the world. In, in 1776, which is when Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nation, as mm -hmm. well as when the United States got started. He said that Western Europe is the only place in the world where there is no slavery. Uh, and even in the Western, even the Western Europeans had vast numbers of slaves in the Western in, Hemisphere, yes. but not in Western Europe itself. And so if you're going to have reparations for slavery, it's going to be the greatest transfer of wealth back and forth. The number of, of people who were enslaved in uh, North Africa by the Barbary pirates exceeded the number of Africans enslaved in the United States and in the American colonies before that put together. I know, but nobody is going to North Africa to ask for reparations because nobody is going to be to give it to them. Him saying, on my way to Africa to ask them why they sold my ancestors to people, then turned around and tried to blame them for slavery, they took no accountability, love beyond color. Number one, just because he's been miseducated about the African resistance of slavery, don't make it true. Number two, this particular obscuring of history glosses over how African leaders like the King of Congo wrote a letter to the King of Portugal telling him to stop slavery. Number three, that's important because like it says right here, this letter contradicts the story that African kings sold their own into slavery as been retold by the countless times in history books. Moreover, this also shows that similar to Queen Gazinga's stance against the slavery, a century later she fought almost 40 years against Portuguese for the freedom of her people. Number four, King Alfonso of Congo literally converted to Catholicism in order to try to earn his humanity of not only him, but also his people. In this letter he wrote, each day the traitors are not people, children of this country, sons of our nobles and vassals, even people of our own family. This corruption and depravity uh, are so widespread that our land is entirely depopulated. Number five, as stated in the earlier point, we also have Queen Nzinga of present day Angola. The monarch of the Madumbu people was a resilient leader who fought against the Portuguese from expanding their slave trade in Central Africa. Number six, even when he says try to blame people for slavery and took no accountability, what does he mean? Number six, this man being so facetious that even when it comes to African involvement in slavery, we see that Ghana has formally apologized for their role in that transatlantic slave trade as well as Benign. Number eight, you see it says love beyond color right here and love beyond color right here, right? It's almost like he's trying to all lives matter his way into gaslighting black folks for a little bit of attention. Am I right or am I right? Number nine, not only did Ghana take accountability for his involvement with the slave trade, they've also encouraged African Americans to come back home saying they will help us set up. Number 10, this is an illustration of how you sell your way into buying into anti-black dispositions about your people at the expense of getting a little bit of you. 
Number 11, I know some folks in the comments are going to try to bring it up. The same way we can acknowledge that this country was built on free slave labor is the same reason why the descendants of those enslaved people ain't ready to leave yet. Pay with me. Number 12, how come we never pose the question, if you don't like hearing them in a country built on, why don't you leave? My final point, what did we learn here today, class? That these folks be so lost in the sauce, they will make up claims, put out the side of their neck just to be able to get a couple views. And that's what we call trying to manufacture a conflict for your people at the expense of what? Trying to sell some hoodies? Education is elevation. And speaking of selling hoodies, man, <laughs> I ain't gonna sell my dignity for mine, though. Welcome back, my viewers. Now, according to the research, historical records indicate that some African societies engaged in the capture and sale of fellow Africans to European slave traders during the transatlantic slave trade. Now, this practice was not uniform across the continent and different African societies had diverse economic, social, and political structures. Various factors contributing to this grim aspect of history, including internal conflicts, power struggles, and economic incentives. European slave traders took advantage of existing rivalries and alliances to acquire enslaved individuals through welfare, raids, or trade. Now, it's crucial to note that this involvement in the slave trade does not absorb the responsibility of European nations for their significant role in orchestrating and perpetuating the transatlantic slave trade, which resulted in immense suffering and exploitation. The history of the transatlantic slave trade is a complex and painful chapter in the shared history of Africa, Europe, and the Americas. Now, the transatlantic slave trade was a brutal and dehumanizing system that lasted for several centuries, involving the forced transportation of millions of Africans to the Americas to work as slaves on plantations. While it's true that some African societies participated in the capture and sale of individuals to European slave traders, it's important to understand the broader context. Now, the demand for enslaved labor was primarily driven by European colonial powers and their pursuit of economic interests, particularly in industries like sugar, tobacco, and cotton. European slave traders provided incentives such as arms and other goods, which influenced certain African groups to engage in slave trading. However, the collaboration between African and European actors in the slave trade should not be viewed in isolation. The immense scale and brutality of the transatlantic slave trade were largely orchestrated and perpetuated by European colonial powers. The impact of this historical injustice continues to shape social, economic, and cultural dynamics in Africa and the Americas today, underscoring the need for a announced understanding of this complex historical period. Now, European engagement with African societies in the transatlantic slave trade involved a combination of economic incentives, exploitation of existing social structures, and the use of force. Several key mechanisms facilitated European involvement in this grim trade. European traders provided various goods including arms, textiles, and other commodities which had significant value in African societies. Now this incentivized some African leaders and traders to participate in the slave trade for economic gain. Establishment of coastal forts. Europeans built forts along the African coast creating trading posts for the exchange of goods. Now these forts served as bases for European slave traders to conduct negotiations with African merchants and leaders. Interference in local conflict. European traders often took advantage of existing conflicts and power struggles among African societies. So they provided support to one faction against another, exhibiting tensions and creating an environment conducive to the capture and sale of individuals as slaves. Kidnapping and raids. In some instances, European slave traders engaged in kidnapping or organized raids to capture individuals for the slave trade. This involved violent and coercive tactics to acquire slaves directly by passing local African intermediaries. The use of middlemen. European traders often relied on African middlemen or intermediaries who played crucial roles in capturing and transporting slaves. Now, these middlemen could be local leaders, traders, or individuals who facilitated the exchange between European slave traders and African communities. Now, the transatlantic slave trade spanning roughly from the 15th to the 19th centuries has profound and lasting impacts on Africa, Europe, and the Americas. While European engagement in the trade involved Involved economic incentives and coercive tactics, it's crucial to recognize the diversity of African societies and their varied responses to European involvement. Africa is a vast and diverse continent with numerous ethnic groups, cultures, and societies. Not all African communities participated in or benefited from the slave trade, and many actively resisted it. The slave trade disrupted local economies, led to the depopulation of some regions, and fueled conflicts within African societies. The loss of millions of individuals through enslavement had profound and enduring consequences for the continent. European
African colonial powers delayed a central role in orchestrating the transatlantic slave trade as they established colonies in the Americas. The demand for enslaved labor grew exponentially, further entrenching the trade and perpetuating the cycle of exploitation. Over time, enlightenment, ideals and changing moral perspectives led to the rise of abolitionist movements in Europe and the Americas. Efforts to end the transatlantic slave trade gained momentum in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The legacy of the transatlantic slave trade is still felt today, influencing socio-economic and cultural dynamics in Africa and the Americas. The impact on African diaspora communities and the persistence of racial inequalities are among the lasting consequences. Now, as I was carrying out my research, I found an article by Adobe Trisha Nwawani confronting Africa's role in the slave trade. This is a very sensitive essay published in the Wall Street Journal on the African role in the transatlantic and trans-Saharan slave trade. Now, she observes that the 400th anniversary of the arrival of slaves in Virginia coincides with questions about guilt and responsibility and a debate in the United States about reparations to the descendants of slaves. She observes that this fraught debate is largely absent in Africa, even though Africans were deeply involved in the slave trade. Africans raided for slaves often in connivance with local chiefs and then acted as middlemen with European and Arab purchasers. She recounts stories of the ambivalence of at least some Africans about the role of their ancestors in the slave trade. Now, she reports that Donald Duke, former governor of Calabar State and a good government presidential candidate in the 2019 Nigerian elections, acknowledges that his ancestors participated in the slave trade. However, Duke says, I'm not ashamed of it because I personally wasn't directly involved. Now, Nwawani's welcome report provides another dimension to the conversation about slavery in Africa as well as in the United States. But the subject is painful. Nwawani recounts a conversation with a Tanzanian now living in the United States because of the crimes, the pain, the, the humiliation that I saw them, descendants of slaves, suffer in the United States. He avoided talking about his family's role in slavery, instead highlighting Tanzanian music, architecture, and poetry. Though the, the histories are interlinked, former Governor Duke does not believe that Africa should play a role in the American reparations debate. After all, the focus of the debate is in on maltreatment and injustice in the United States, not Africa. We have come to the end of the video. What do you have to say about this topic? Share your views in the comment section and let's hear what you have to say about this.